Hi, this morning I have the distinct pleasure of talking to Dr. Paul Ridka. Dr. Ridka is a cardiologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He is also Eugene Brownwood Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is also the Director of Center for Cardiovascular Disease Prevention at Harvard Medical School. Uh, Dr. Ridka has worked, worked extensively uh, in the area of inflammation as it relates to atherosclerosis. His work has helped us to better understand how inflammation contributes to the uh, onset of atherosclerosis. Uh, Dr. Ridka, it's a pleasure having you here this morning. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here on Fits in the Go, and I must say, uh, working with the fellows is one of my favorite activities, so thank you for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the first, just to kick the conversation this morning, uh, the first thing I would like to ask you is, can you just briefly explain to us what residual inflammatory risk is about? Residual inflammatory risk is a term that we coined only about six years ago to try to emphasize to our clinical colleagues that atherosclerosis is fundamentally a disorder of two processes one of which they know well, which is lipid accumulation, but the other is this biologic process of low-grade systemic inflammation. Clinicians are pretty used to the idea of residual cholesterol risk. So I put a patient on a high-intensity statin, I measure the LDL, the LDL is still above some threshold, I want to lower it further, that's residual cholesterol risk. What we're talking about with residual, residual inflammatory risk is, same thing, put them on a statin, but then measure the CRP. And if the CRP has not dropped below two milligrams per liter, we call that residual inflammatory risk. It's a different reason these patients have more events, and we've got to be thinking about inflammation as we move forward. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, can you summarize to us uh, the story you're presenting today, uh, what it's about? Sure. So in the late-breaking uh, trials section today, we'll be presenting some data from three trials. Uh, Prominent, which was run by my research group, uh, Reduce It, which is run by Deepak Bot's research group, and the Strength Trial run by Steve Nissen's research group. But what we're actually trying to do here is put together data on 31,245 contemporary statin-treated patients. Why are we doing that? 25 years ago, we demonstrated that in primary prevention, inflammation and hyperlipidemia both contribute to this disease in equal proportion. But today, and particularly your generation of the fellows, everybody should be on a statin, and in my practice, a high-intensity statin. So the question becomes, how much has this changed? So we simply measured high-sensitivity CRP and LDL cholesterol in these 31,000 patients all on a statin, and then asked the question, does it predict MACE, does it predict cardiovascular death and all-cause mortality? Well, to our surprise, because we, we thought both would probably predict equally still. That wasn't the case. What we found was that high sensitivity CRP was a very powerful predictor of future vascular events, almost a threefold risk across quartiles for cardiovascular death and all-cause mortality. But somewhat to our surprise, the LDL levels were much more modest and quite a bit smaller predictor. That doesn't mean LDL lowering doesn't matter. Of course it matters. But what it's telling us is that the inflammatory process has just not been adequately dealt with yet and that we as cardiologists, particularly you younger cardiologists, are gonna to have to figure out ways to target this inflammation or we're not gonna beat this disease. Fantastic, thank you very much, fantastic. Uh, so what's the clinical implication of your findings from this study? Um, how is it relevant to clinical practice? I think there's a couple of things that are very important. The reason this paper is coming out in the Lancet is because it has some major implications. The first is, although our guidelines still don't do this 25 years later, they should. We should be measuring C-reactive protein in all of our patients. Let me, let me put it this way. You would never give an LDL-lowering drug without first measuring LDL. Correct. You would never treat blood pressure without actually measuring the blood, blood pressure. pressure. I think it's just absurd that we're not measuring inflammation and telling us, aha, this patient's problem is residual inflammatory risk. We should be addressing that. That's number one. Number two is good preventive cardiology. Diet, exercise, smoking cessation, playing tennis this morning, for example. <laughs> um, these are things that lower CRP and they lower cardiovascular risk. So I use the CRP information with my patients to encourage lifestyle. And I also model it for them in my clinic. Number three is probably most important. Uh, our Cantos trial a couple of years ago proved that if you target inflammation in a specific pathway, it gets a little technical, but it's the NLRP3 to IL-1 to IL-6 pathway that actually leads to the production of the biomarker to the CRP, that you can lower cardiovascular event rates by 15 to 17% um, without changing LDL or APOB. So Cantos proves that targeting inflammation matters. 
But we have a very inexpensive, very effective drug that no one's using. That's colchicine. Now, you guys, because you read, know that there's been two major New England Journal of Medicine papers, Colcott and Ladoco 2, 0.5 milligrams of colchicine given once a day. I would not give the drug in the patient with a chronic kidney disease, but in the absence of chronic kidney disease, you're getting 30% reductions in risk, which by the way, just think about that. That's, That's twice the effect that we get from PCSK9 inhibitors. It's larger than what we saw from bepidoic acid at these meetings, and we're not doing it. So I would challenge our future people who are gonna be taking care of me when I get older. That's you guys. Why aren't we taking the drugs that really work? And I think part of the answer here is, colchicine is effectively generic. There's no one telling you to use it. There's no one buying lunches for the fellows to say to you, hey, use our drug. Um, and we will have to think about what that means. So I think that's the third. The last is the new trials that we're doing. Uh, my research group is running a series of trials globally, uh, moving beyond interleukin-1. We, we think the target is actually interleukin-6. And so there's a series of trials that are named after a bunch of Greek gods. Don't ask me why. Uh, one is called Zeus. Uh, remember I said a minute ago, I cannot give colchicine to my patients of chronic kidney disease. That's right. very important right. uh, because it's renally excreted. Right. However, the Zeus trial is saying, let's target atherosclerosis patients with an elevated CRP who have stage three or four CKD. Extremely high risk group, common patients. They're getting a novel interleukin-6 ligand monoclonal, something called ziltavecumab or placebo. Right. A second trial is gonna look at HEFPEF with this IL-6 inhibition, and we're about to launch a acute myocardial infarction trial with IL-6 inhibition. Wow. So it's pretty exciting. Wow, excellent, amazing work. Uh, this is really, really, really good for practice. Uh, just a general question now, what, what, would, what would be your advice for young doctors, oncoming doctors, you have achieved great things in medicine. Um, for younger doctors coming up, what would be your advice to them uh, for those who want to follow in your footsteps? <laughs> I think one of the challenges for fellows and young faculty members is to look inside yourself and figure out what makes me happy, what am I good at, and hopefully if you can, look, you can find those two things in the same setting. So some of my colleagues happen to be particularly good at bench research. Some happen to be particularly good at tra what we do, translational research. Some happen to be just fantastic doctors. Some happen to turn out to be very good at administration. There's many different pathways in cardiovascular medicine. Right. The question is, what will you individually be best at? What's gonna make you happy? Right. I think in the end of the day, uh, a cardiovascular career is quite long. And the real challenge is finding some work-life balance, tough for you guys in training, but also finding joy in the work. And um, beyond that, I would say, whichever one of those things you pick, find a good mentor. You need someone who will look out for you, protect you a bit, and also sort of help you to move through this process of how do I be better known? How do I really learn how to do research? How do I really learn how to administrate? How do I learn to be the best doctor I can possibly be? Um, you know who those people are in your program. Seek them out. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's really helpful.